can you that's is that okay for everyone i think you should hear me and see me perfect both thank you well thank you ever so much for uh letting me speak here this is really um a talk describing mostly work by other people um, that i've had a hand in and uh really giving trying to give some of this work a little bit of publicity and hopefully offer some insights that are useful to other people um, who, who are interested in similar things. So innovating complex evidence synthesis through interactive shiny applications. This work's been done as part of the NICE um, complex review support unit. Uh, and this unit focuses on providing timely and appropriate support for the delivery of complex reviews that are found that are all supported by NIHRs. And that includes a lot of Cochrane reviews. Uh, so we provide flexible, timely and appropriate response to specific requests to support successful delivery of complex reviews, or at least that's what we try to do. And as well as that contribute to building capacity and capability within the research community. Now, when we um, started, we, we were given quite an open canvas in terms of how we did this and how we tried to achieve these uh, goals. And we identified several barriers and, and two, two important ones are that there was a lack of awareness about more sophisticated and arguably more appropriate synthesis methods. Um, people could have been using and weren't to make the most of their data and answer the most relevant clinical questions. That's a big issue, but it's a different talk. The second major observation and the one I'm going to talk about today is really seeing that there was a lack of statistical software expertise to implement the methods. Many people doing systematic reviews maybe don't have experienced statistical support. And, and this goes for whether you're doing Cochrane reviews, maybe a bit less so in the HDA context. I, I've not worked so much in that in, in very recent years. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what people think. Anyway, we, the two obvious things to do, uh, and possibly the most obvious was to run training courses using advanced software to do the more sophisticated methods. Uh, this would be in things like R, of course, uh, and maybe using bugs or stand through R to, if we wanted to use Bayesian sampling for estimation. And in the end, we really eschewed this and went for what may have not been the easy option, but possibly the better long term solution, which is to create user friendly software for the non expert to use to implement specific advanced synthesis models. So that is uh, the challenge we set ourselves a few years ago and what I'm going to talk about is, is, is how far we got and what we learned in the process and how successful it was. To start with, I'm just going to give uh, a little bit of what I'm calling uh, prehistory. And this will be in, of interest, I think, to this, um, this, this uh, group because it was very much in the HDA uh, field. What we did was we did develop this thing called a transparent interactive decision interrogator to facilitate the decision-making process in healthcare. And I've not managed to catch all the talks. I've got ch children off uh, with um, COVID exposure, etc. So it's been a bit of a mad couple of days, but the, I did catch the first talk, which was talking about um, shiny models for decision uh, analytical modeling and being able to change parameters extra, extra to explore those. Well, we, this is what we try to do, but we also try to link in the meta analyses to these. Um, so this was actually used in a real uh, nice HDA appraisal meeting and, and the panel could say, well, what happens if you know the event rate was halved here or doubled? And we could try and give real time answers to those sorts of questions. We could say, we don't, somebody could say, I don't like that study. It wasn't quite the same or whatever. What happens if we exclude that from the meta analysis? What's the impact right through onto the decision model? So what, what we've got to remember is this was done in 2011 and uh, shiny wasn't even in a twinkle in somebody's eye by then i don't think and we used a mixture of r to excel r to win bugs win bugs r and excel sort of five packages held together with sellotape and a wing in a prayer uh and, and some pretty nifty expertise that was brought to it um and i think that was kind of ahead of the time this is where we knew we wanted to go uh, but it was very difficult with the tools there, to, to, certainly to sort of roll out to other people. 
Um, what we, of course, with the advent of Shiny and it is the power it offers, you know, that was a natural choice. And we've ended up so far developing four apps, and I'm going to talk briefly about three of those today. Meta Insight conducts network meta analysis, Meta DTA conducts meta analysis of diagnostic tests. Those are probably the two most common areas of non-straightforward meta-analysis we deal with. And then we did an interesting thing, um, looking at a proof of concept shadowing a uh, COVID-19 living systematic review um, and explored uh, being able to do what I've really just been talking about for that um, tidy example, being able to critique and change and explore that analysis on the fly. Oh, and finally, there was a primer. That is the bit I did, which was really just an explorable exploration designed to teach the basics of diagnostic test accuracy, but doing it with Shiny in an interactive manner with questions and answers and sliders and, and, and such thing to hopefully make it more visually appealing and, and easier to understand. All these apps can be found at that page there, so I've not given the links to individual apps. And we've had a pretty much for the uh, most of them general principles. We wanted to develop them using the R package Shiny. Uh, we started small, so we got things out and we've con these have been expanded. We've had multiple updates and different people have come on board and done great work over time. We never want to reinvent the wheel. So if a package does the type of analysis we want to implement, we will always use that when um, in the Shiny package. We're not trying to do things from ground zero if you like we we want to leverage and stand on the shoulder of all those giants that have gone before us and made great packages it's got to be free to use open source it's point and click interface so it's accessible obviously on the on the web um when we want to do bayesian models we're fitting those in jags and stand for their simulation engines we always want to vi emphasize visual descriptions of results not just chucking out what r gives you in terms of maybe numerical outputs unprocessed or and not had thought about its presentation and one kind of thing that i was in having a sort of a program of work over the years in methods for, for synthesis we wanted new methodological developments within the d uh the, in our group and of course with others this could be a place to make them immediately accessible over time and we've started to do that so um oh, yeah basically meta insight basically conducts met network meta analysis for binary continuous outcomes frequent and bayesian analysis is incorporated now and you can do some of the more sophisticated inconsistency and model fit things we've got more graphical representations coming soon and this is some of the uh, innovative work that we're doing that actually will feed into the app. So other methodological work, people want survival analysis and inclusion of covariates, and we hope to offer those very soon as well. And the first paper on that app is, is cited at the bottom. Here's a very brief look at it, but of course you can go and play with it if you're interested. So I'm not going to sit here and give shiny demos. You've seen plenty of those already. Meta DTA conducts bivariate meta analysis of sensitivity and specificity simultaneously. And we've started ex going beyond that by exploring the impact of covariates in plots and plotting things like the quality of ROC on ROC plots, looking at the clinical impact for given disease prevalence as what that means for patients in terms of a given sense and spec and a prevalence. We've got a big update coming soon. Uh, we're gonna include covariates, essentially it's been rewritten in a all using uh stand as the engine uh, allowing imperfect gold standard modeling and a full interface overhaul and we people want multiple threshold methodology which is the first on our wish list again we've had a paper published there on that this is that ideas uh, of these are the seven dimensions of quality uh, and generalizability that go into uh, the quadas tool and if you've got that data which many reviewers have it allows you to plot all those dimensions on the point on roc space for that study and it gives you an immediate view of how good quality the studies are and what their results are simultaneously and again there's a paper written on that this is uh just showing the front end we followed this covid living 
uh, network metro analysis for the treatments for COVID and just saw, can we kind of wrap what we're doing around a particular data set to give people the option of doing further interrogation, subgroup analysis and further exploration. And, and that was a success and we're gonna go on and build off that, which is really no more than a proof of concept study. Things I didn't think about at the beginning, but we're certainly having to think about it uh, as we go on doing this is the support for the user base. We're delighted these apps get about 800 hours a month use. Uh, but we do get two or three queries a week from we're not funded to set up. We currently try and answer questions on those, but of course that can't be sustained, sustained indefinitely on fresh air. Uh, and indeed, as, as grants run out, there is the issue of modest shiny account costs that need to, to be uh, looked at and whether we'll set up our own shiny server in the future. We'll, we'll, we're thinking about that to avoid those. Um, some of people try to put very large data sets in these packages, which is totally understandable if that's your data and a lot, some of the graphics fall over on that and we're trying to make things more scalable and that's something that we didn't think about at the beginning. Um, we're hoping to get more funds to carry on this work. Our current funding ends in, in, in November this year. We want to develop a, a new app for component network meta-analysis. Uh, we want to keep adding features to existing ones and a very important one that we want to put across the apps is allowing you to get the R commands used behind the scenes here. Uh, to, uh, so really it allows people to know exactly what's been done, it allows an expert to look at those, critique them, it allows people to do a little bit more than the apps can do by taking that code and just adding to it. Very good for in terms of improving transparency and reproducibility of the work. We're thinking about making educational versions of the apps to teach about the methods before people actually try and use them. Um, and also we're thinking not only about analysis, but also like a viewer that people can encapsulate in digital versions of their papers, which sort of goes on a little bit with a COVID um, proof of concept study that we did earlier to see if we can leverage some of the benefits we've already got to make a more interactive reporting uh, for people doing evidence synthesis, whether that be for HDA or, or just on their own. Okay, I, I hope I haven't gone too far over time. There is a story for the shaky start, but I'm, I'd be delighted uh, with any questions you may have, I'll try and answer. Well, uh, Alex, you're on the time, so I think we actually have uh, we, we have a, a scope for a, a little bit of discussion here. It looks like it'd be quite exciting to be involved in your team, given that you're doing so much and there's so much development uh, going on. I mean, it seems quite taxing to have to do an awful lot. Is it easy to get or people to do all of those? You said you had a wish list and you can't necessarily get through everything and managing the demands. How is the kind of the human resource side of doing all of this? I, I would say, and it's not just because a few of them are on the line now, but uh, I consider we've been very lucky and in a, perhaps even the decision to attempt to do this was made um, by modest starts, by talented people. The first, the, the, the DTA and, and the first uh, app for the, for the network metrosis as well were both done as projects, three month projects by students and um, to sort of just get proof of concept up and running. We're delighted one of those uh, students has then come back and subsequently worked uh, on, on the apps with us. And we've actually managed to find people who have got both enthusiasm and a great ability for that as well. So all those names on my first slide there, I'm not gonna try and wheel them off because I'll forget somebody, but um, they've all, uh, managed to push these on significantly and we have got some retention of staff we're hoping to be able to do that going forward as well but I agree if um, I think you know you have to have the right type of people and it, it, uh, it's not for everyone this work but we found it it been quite a synergistic and, and good team. Yeah I, I think uh, Anthony Hatswell is just uh, making the point you've found some in, impressive students it is always nice to be able to though, do proof of concept and, and raise something there are some questions in the chat that I'd like to get to. I'm, it's not the first one that came up, uh, but I just want to go to Joanne Gregory's first. I'm just going to read it out because it's very brief and I'll come to uh, Kashif in a second. So jo Joanne Gregory asks, um, wonder if you come across some very long run times and have been challenged there? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, that's another problem I could have gone into. The, the, the biggest challenge is when you're doing things like the inconsistency assessment in a network meta-analysis which is Bayesian so essentially you've got to 
I get this slightly wrong, but it's something like rerun the model for every treatment in the model, uh, something like that, isn't it? Or is it every study? Anyway, it, it can be a lot of reruns, all done. And um, I think the maximum idle you can have on uh, is something like 20 minutes. And there's also memory issues as well. So if you've got very large network meta-analyses and you want to do those things, we recommend you down, we, we've given the apps away open source so you can download the app and install it locally to use rather than trying to use over the web version. And that usually solves all the problems. Super, I should also ask that Joanne Gregory said, great talk. So uh, um, I might call on Kashif. Do you, you want to go and um, unmute yourself, Kashif, and, uh, and ask a question yourself? Yeah, great. Thank you, James. And thank you for the for this great presentation. I mean, like my only worries with this within the NMA side of the thing is is always that uh, uh, I mean we tried on a couple of apps, but at a time we can run one one type of outcomes only. So just I mean within within your app, are you able to run multiple outcomes simultaneously and can generate the output? No. Uh, that's a simple no. Unfortunately, we've not tackled that. I mean, obviously, you can paste sequentially, have two windows open if you like, and it, it fire up two versions, but um, it, it won't. It's not set up. Again, the more we've debated these things, and of course, the more features you add, the more you, you'll start looking like base R or a more complicated package. You know, it's always a, a way up. Are you trying to make something accessible or comprehensive? Uh, th that doesn't mean that sometimes displays of multiple outcomes simultaneously might not be valuable. And that's something we're wrestling with at the moment, but no immediate plans. Yeah, I mean, like <clears throat> we tried something uh, by adding multiple outcomes, the only challenge remains that at a time you can run one outcomes, <laughs> one outcome and generate the output because our purpose was to create one purpose tool, at least for the in-house efficiencies. Yeah, so I mean, it, it will be it will be slightly slower, but you know, um, I mean, one one nice comment we've had is we we developed this people for essentially novices and and to increase the capacity. We've had some very nice comments from very experienced statisticians who said, "Oh, I use it if I'm not doing anything really, you know, that's pushing my limits." You know, it's just mm -hmm. nice to use uh, and I don't need a, a, a programming interface. So, you know, we, we've had positive feedback even from quite advanced users. Super. And, and Dawn, do you want to ask the final question here? Just to... Yeah, sure. I was just wondering how this was received when you actually took it for live decision making. Um, oh. Were there any issues with the trust challenges we mentioned earlier? Yeah, well, um, crikey. Yes, that's a little while ago when we did the full thing back then. That that was brave. Um, I had, again, a good p couple of people sitting next to me that, that had done a lot of the programming um, and, and didn't get a lot of the credit for it. It, it was slightly nerve wracking. One thing I should say, we, a lot of it had to be run deterministically to get it to run in time. You know, there was no compilation in C for speed like they were doing earlier uh, in earlier talks here. It was where I received it was used a reasonable amount, not huge huge amount. I was relieved just to get out of the room and not look an idiot, which I think we certainly achieved. Um, we weren't necessarily as back. There was a lot of work involved, you know, and one thing I'm interested in, and if I had a question for people doing these things like the full decision model in Shiny is how many of the components can you reuse? You know, can we make these things modular? So the build time for your next model isn't, isn't um, you know, from the ground up again, how much of this can we modulize and, and reuse? Um, so yeah, it, it was well, quite well received. I think we were. Ve I was very proud because I thought it was pretty much ahead of the time. It wasn't particularly user friendly. It needed work. I think now's the time if people wanted to build on it. Okay, uh, super. Thanks very much. I'm going to have to move on there because I've been a bit indulgent with the with the questions, but I think that's just because it was an uh, a great talk. It was great.